Guidance is internal. 12, 11, 10, 9. Ignition sequence start. 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. All engine running. We have a liftoff. Liftoff on Apollo 11. Shadow. Four forward, drift into the right a little. 30 seconds. Forward drift. Contact light. Okay, engine stop. Tranquility base here. The Eagle has landed. Rocket Tranquility, we copy you on the ground. You got a bunch of guys in the back of the turn. We're pretty busy for a Armstrong is on the moon. Yeah, Neil Armstrong. 38 year old American standing on the surface of the moon. On this July 20th, 1969. That's one small step for man. One giant leap for mankind. Oh, that looks beautiful, Daniel. And it has a stark beauty all its own. It's uh, like much of the high desert of the uh, United States. It's uh, different, but it's very pretty out here. Yeah, it's just beautiful. Yeah, it's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. Yeah, it's pretty out here. Magnificent flight out here. Magnificent desolation. Tranquility Base, uh, Houston. Guidance recommendation uh, is pings, and you're cleared for takeoff. Roger, understand. We're number one on the runway. Seven, six, five, engine arm asset. to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard, because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills, because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept. It was the early 1960s, and President Kennedy had set the stage. Apollo 11, moon landing. It's called Landing Site 2, a section of moon landscape covering roughly three by six and one half miles. If all goes as planned, the first Americans will land and explore a portion of this area. Astronauts Neil A. Armstrong, Edwin E. Aldrin, and Michael Collins, the three men who will make the next and most historic round trip to the moon. It is Collins who will be in charge of the cone-shaped command module circumnavigating the moon as his two compatriots descend and land on the lunar surface. Born in Rome, Italy, October 31st, 1930, Collins served as pilot during the three-day Gemini 10 mission in 1966. Astronaut Buzz Aldrin, the lunar module pilot, will fly with Armstrong to touch down on the moon. It was Aldrin who established a new record for time outside a craft in space more than five and one half hours during Gemini 12. The 39-year-old astronaut has an impressive background, including a doctorate. I attended uh, public uh, schools in my hometown of Montclair, New Jersey. Uh, received an appointment to the United States Military Academy at West Point. Uh, I was commissioned in the Air Force, flew in the Korean War for about six months, sent over to Germany flying F-100 aircraft, in 1959, applied for admission into uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology to study uh, astronautics in greater depth, leading toward a Doctor of Science degree. That we've never before even thought to ask. And this will be the, the challenge to the next generation. Once on the moon, Armstrong and Aldrin will take photographs, dig for lunar soil samples, 
collect rock specimens and set up scientific experiments to remain after they have left. To gain data about the moon's interior and meteoroid impacts, they will deploy a device for recording seismic activity. Another experiment will precisely measure Earth-Moon distances. The crew of Apollo 11 have been preceded by 15 unmanned lunar explorers. These first close-up photographs were recorded by a Ranger spacecraft just before it slammed into the Moon's surface. Following Ranger, Surveyor, craft which soft landed and verified that a man could walk there. Charting and mapping of mountains, craters, and other surface features was the job of Lunar Orbiter. This high-flying picture taker helped determine the best landing sites for the Apollo astronauts. It's called Spacecraft 107, housing for the three men as they fly to the moon and back. The onboard oxygen, water, food, and electricity provide a self-contained bit of Earth environment for the astronauts. The command module is approximately 12 feet by 12 feet in size and weighs 13,000 pounds with the crew at liftoff. Through the years, the Apollo command module has been put through many rigorous tests. Some, like this one, to prove its seaworthiness. Connected to the command module is the 22-foot-long service module, weighing 51,000 pounds. In addition to the rocket engine for returning the men to Earth, it holds oxygen supplies and fuel cells. There was no room for error in the development of the spider-like lunar module, which will actually land on the moon. It must do its job. It must be able to descend to the lunar surface, land, and take off at mission's end. This is the craft assigned to that first moon landing. The lunar module is in two parts. The bottom stage, with its descent engine, will lower astronauts Armstrong and Aldrin gently to the lunar surface on a pillar of rocket exhaust. This stage then acts as a launching platform for the upper section, with its ascent engine lifting the two men back up to join Michael Collins, orbiting in the command ship. The combined spacecraft is shown here during final checkout. The Saturn V rocket, which will boost Apollo 11 off the launch pad and toward the moon, is put together inside the vehicle assembly building at the Kennedy Space Center. When the three stages and guidance unit are locked in place for rollout to pad 39A, the giant space vehicle stands 363 feet high, powerful enough to thrust a 50-ton payload into lunar orbit. Since 1959, 73 men have been accepted into the astronaut program. Here, nine of those most recently selected take part in jungle training exercises at the Tropic Survival School in the Panama Canal Zone. Although all U.S. astronauts have landed in the ocean after returning from space, the spacecraft are so designed that in an emergency, they can safely come down over land. Since there is a remote possibility that this could occur, all astronauts are taught how to survive in both the jungle and the desert. During their four-day course in the wilds of Panama, the astronauts were dropped into the water in a swamp penetration exercise. Studied some of the various jungle animals at a zoo set up especially for this purpose. Took an overnight trek through the jungle. chopped down trees for shelter and fuel, built fires and cooked wild game, and met with some of the local Indians. 
At a place called Pasco, 100 miles southwest of Spokane, Washington, the astronauts took part in another intensive training course, Desert Survival. One of the first things the men had to learn was how to build a shelter to protect themselves from the hot sun. A combination of parachutes and life raft seemed to do the job. Improvise is the key word to desert survival. Here they dig a water still. By digging a hole in the sand and covering it with plastic, what little moisture there is in the soil condenses on the underside of the plastic and drips into a container. Even a crash helmet makes an acceptable shovel. Another important technique they learned was how to attract the attention of rescue airplanes. By using signal mirrors and markers, they made themselves visible from overhead. Hopefully, survival training will never have to be used. But should the contingency take place, the astronauts will be well prepared. Radiating from the rocket like a fan of humanity. The most people ever to watch a space launch. Closest on the press site, their cameras jostling for position, 4,000 newsmen, many of whom had never written a space story before in their lives, but they came for Apollo 11. So in the VIP area did dignitaries from all over the world, several hundred congressmen and the vice president of the United States. And so on the perimeters of this tightly guarded moon port did the people perhaps half a million of them, far more than ever before. History was here, history observed in shirt sleeves and bikinis, history seen from little rented sailboats in the Banana River and from the tailgates of camper wagons in Titusville, history viewed through a haze of smoking charcoal grills. But for half a million Americans, staying home and watching was not enough. Countdown for Apollo 11, the flight to land of the first men on the moon. The swing arm now coming back as our countdown continues. Zero, all engine running.
Once the spacecraft rockets out of Earth orbit, the moon is a three-day journey. The crew is the tip of the iceberg. In Apollo 11, there were 400,000 people underneath that all had to do their job or we weren't going to make it. And I think every crew realized that. It was a team effort of NASA that got us to the moon. These are uh, probably the finest systems engineers at the world. They're all young. Uh, average age was 26. I was the oldest guy that day. I was 36. OK, guys, it's now time to get down to business. Uh, we're about ready to land uh, a man on the moon. And uh, I start talking to him because I feel compelled to talk. I was probably the most emotional of the flight directors. From the day of our birth, we were meant for this time and place. And today, we will land an American on the moon. Whatever happens here today, I will stand behind every decision you will make. We came into this room as a team, and we will leave as a team. And I tell my ground controller to lock the control room doors. And from now on, no person will leave or enter this room until we have either landed, we have crashed, or we have aborted. Those are the only three outcomes from this time on. The first thing, obviously, that we're going to have to do is to undock from the command module. Roger, how does it look? Stay in the Right. And then uh, we rotated around so that Mike could sort of make a quick check of our landing gear. Listen, baby, everything's going just swimmingly. Beautiful. Then the first thing we need to do is establish communication with the Earth. Here's the Eagle, how do you read? Bye bye, Eagle, we're standing by for your burn report, over. Roger, the burn was on time. Tempo in the room picks up right as we acquire spacecraft telemetry and we immediately got problems. X and Z notes. We got communications problems you cannot believe. Columbia, Houston, we've lost all data with uh, Eagle. Please add in three of one high gain, over. We couldn't communicate with the lunar module. Mike Collins could because he could see him. He could point his antennas at him and talk to him. So what we would do is we would say, uh, Mike, have the crew select a different antenna. We'd love to tell him to go ask Omni over. Take uh, Omni Bravo or Omni Delta. Will you roll the spacecraft a little bit for us? He'd roll the spacecraft and we'd get data. Eagle Houston, uh, we recommend uh, y'all 10 right will help us on the uh, high gain signal strength over. Yeah, you should have now, Houston. Eagle, we got you now. It's looking good. Over. And at a descent minus five minutes, I give the go for a power descent. Go to con you go to continue power descent. You're a go to continue power descent. The descent was very tricky business. Okay, you now, Our plan was to start about 50,000 feet now. altitude, 3,000 miles per hour, to use one continuous rocket burn to decelerate to a hover in the landing area. Eagle Houston, everything's looking good here, over. Throttle up. And I get confirmed throttle up, and telemetry drops out again. And I'm back in this ground roll. Do I have enough information to continue the descent or not? OK, all flight controllers going to go for landing. Retro, go. Lido, go. Guide, go. Control, go. Telcom, go. GNC, go. Ecom, go. Surgeon, go. Capcom, we're go for landing. Houston, you're go for landing, over. And about that time, uh, we got a, a computer alarm of 1202. 1202. The computer was giving us trouble. It was a big attention getter. My first thought, oh no, we've lost it. We're not going to make it. All we had was 1202, which is kind of disconcerting. Uh, you lose information, plus you've got an alarm, and you don't really know what it is. Give us a reading on the 1202 program alarm. I was reaching for my checklist to turn to this program alarm when the guidance guy, Steve Bale, said, we're go, flight on that alarm. Gene took his word, you know, okay, we're go. He didn't ask for explanation, we're go. Roger, we got you, we're going that alarm. 
Now the landing radar can begin to pick up range and velocity of the ground beneath us, and it compares that with what the uh, computer thinks it ought to be, and there's a big difference. Hold on. Our position check down range to be a little off. Roger. 1201. 1201. Well, it's extremely serious. Is the computer breaking? Is it telling us it's not functioning right? 1201, roger, 1201 alarm. What is the alarm telling us? We're go, same type, we're go. Same type, it was a different number, but same type. You said same type flight, we're go. 47 degrees, roger. The computer was so busy, and it couldn't get all the jobs done, so it was dropping off these other little jobs down on the end and not doing them, which were jobs that weren't really that critical. Just as Mission Control decides to ignore the computer alarms, the LEM sends another strange signal. 37 degrees. We just saw this strange trajectory that we'd never seen in training. 200 feet down, three and a half, 47 forward. He went down to about 400 feet, stopped his descent, and leveled off and started flying horizontally across the moon. He didn't tell us, but out the window, what they were seeing was a big boulder field. Our computer was steering us toward football stadium-sized craters, surrounded by steep slopes and covered with very large boulders. 50 down at 2.5, 19 forward, altitude, velocity, light. Neo had the one thing we did not have. He had the out-the-window view. 15 forward. He knew whether he was over a safe place to land or over a boulder field. My job was to tell him how much fuel he had. And when it had zero, that was our best knowledge. We had zero. Five and a half down. forward. The fuel states were falling, and we were getting close to what was going to be an abort situation. 100 feet, three and a half down, nine forward. When we got to about 100 feet, the low-level light came on, and uh, Charlie Duke gave us a call of 60 seconds. Simple call, Eagle, 60 seconds. 60 seconds. We better get on the ground pretty soon. And he had 60 seconds to land, and after that 60 seconds, it would be a board. Down two and a half. I didn't want to disturb Neil's concentration because I knew he was really working that problem. Two and a half, picking up some dust. And now we crew is kicking up some dust, so we know they're darn close to the surface, but they were scooting pretty fast across it last time we heard. Four forward, drift into the right a little. We used most of our remaining fuel, finding a relatively level and smooth landing spot. And a half. 30 seconds. We had 30 seconds to land. I mean, it was deathly silent. Now, I don't think he was going to actually abort. I mean, that wouldn't have been the right stuff. Contact light. Okay, engine stop. HGA had a descent. And I looked over at him, and, and he looked at me. And uh, th there was not a, a great emotion, but there was a, a, a smile of satisfaction on both of our faces, and we shook hands. 413 is in. We copy it down, Eagle. Houston, uh, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. Roger, Twink. Tranquility, we copy you on the ground. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. Thanks a lot. That you finally can say, we just landed the moon. We hit the moon with 17 seconds of fuel remaining. Okay. Um, uh, at the foot of the ladder, the lamb footbeds are only uh, uh, depressed in the surface about uh, one or two inches, uh, although the surface appears to be uh, very very fine grained as you get close to it. It's almost like a powder. Ground mass uh, is very fine. Yep, and then a long one. Okay, I'm going to leave that one foot up there and uh, both hands down about the fourth rung up. There you go. For those who haven't uh, read the plaque, uh, we'll read the plaque that's on the front landing gear of this lamb. 
There's, there's two hemispheres, one showing each of the two hemispheres of Earth. Underneath it says, Dear men from the planet Earth, first set foot upon the moon, July 1969, TV. We came in peace. I guess you're about the only person around that doesn't have TV coverage of the scene. That's alright, I don't mind a bit. How is the quality of the TV? Oh, it's beautiful, Mike, it really is. Oh, geez, that's great. Is the lighting halfway decent? Yes, indeed. They've got the flag up now, and you can see the stars and stripes. From For 30 times, he saw the Earth rise over the horizon of the moon. 12,000 miles of twilight. A line that divides night from day for three billion people on spaceship Earth. It is good to see the whole Earth. To see the Earth whole. Was the moon once molten and volcanic, or has it always been cold and dead? Was it once part of the Earth? Or was it a wandering planet captured by the Earth eons ago? Armstrong and Aldrin, with their precious load of moon rocks, had transferred to Columbia. The faithful eagle, its task completed, could be cut adrift. Columbia fired out of lunar orbit to begin its three-day fall back to Earth, where the recovery fleet was waiting for its splashdown in the Pacific. President of the United States was aboard. Re-entry into the Earth's invisible atmosphere carries with it one of the most critical moments. Traveling nearly 25,000 miles per hour, the command module can miss the angle of re-entry by only several degrees and disintegrate into flames or bounce off into space, never to return. Velocity 33,000 feet per second. 35,000 feet per second now. 36,000 feet per second. We're at entry time. There's blackout.
Houston through a right. Apollo 11 Houston through a right. Apollo 11 Houston through a right four. Hornet reports a sonic boom a short time ago. Apollo 11 Houston and the blind uh, air boss has a visual contact. Apollo 11 Houston through Araya, standing by. Over. Drove. to know that I think I'm the luckiest man in the world. And I say this not only because I have the honor to be President of the United States, but particularly because I have the privilege of uh, speaking for so many and welcoming you back to Earth. Uh, I can tell you about all the messages we've received in Washington. Over 100 foreign governments, emperors and presidents and prime ministers and kings have sent the most warm messages that we've ever received. They represent over two billion people on this earth, all of them who have had the opportunity through television to see what you have done. And then I also bring you messages from members of the cabinet and members of the Senate and members of the House and the Space Agency, from the streets of San Francisco where people stopped me a few days ago and you all love that city, I know as I do. But most important, I had a telephone call yesterday. The toll wasn't incidentally as great as the one I made to you fellows on the moon. <laughs> I made that collect incidentally, in case you didn't know. <laughs> but I called uh, three of, uh, in my view, three of the greatest ladies and most courageous ladies in the whole world today, your wives. And from Jan and Joan and Pat, I bring their love and their congratulations. We think it's just wonderful that they could have participated at least through television in this return. We're only sorry they couldn't be here. And also, I've got to let you in a little secret. I made a date with them. <laughs> uh, I invited them to dinner on, on the 13th of uh, August, right after you come out of quarantine. It will be a state dinner held in Los Angeles. The governors of all the 50 states will be there, the ambassadors, others from around the world and in America. And uh, they told me that you would come too. And all I want to know, will you come? We want to honor you then. <laughs> we'll do anything you say, Mr. President. <laughs> <laughs> Anytime. Uh, one question I think that uh, all of us would like to ask, uh, uh, as we saw you bouncing around in that uh, boat out there, I wonder if that wasn't the hardest part of the journey. Was that the only... Did, did any of you get seasick? No, we didn't, and it, it was uh, one of the harder parts, but it was one of the most pleasant, we can assure you. Yeah. <laughs> well, I just know that uh, uh, you can sense what we all sense. When you get back now, incidentally, you've been able to follow some of the things that have happened when you've gone. Did you know about the All-Star game? Yes, yes sir. The, uh, Capsule communicators have been giving us uh, they daily news reports. Yeah. Were you American League or National League? I'm a National League man. National I'm not sir. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> There's the politician in the group. <laughs> right. <laughs> We're sorry you missed that game. Yes. Well, 
Oh, you knew that too. You really yeah, we heard that. Uh, yeah, the rain. The rain. Right. Well, we haven't learned to control the weather yet, but that's something we can look forward to as tomorrow's challenge. Right, right. Well, I can only summarize it because I don't want to hold you now. You have so much more to do. And gee, you look great. You feel as good as oh, you look. Oh, you great. feel just perfect, Mr. Yeah. President. Yeah. Are you? I understand your Frank Borman says you're a little younger by reason of having going into space. Is that right? Do you feel that way? A little younger? We're a lot younger than Frank Borman. <laughs> 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 there he is over there. <laughs> Come on over, Frank, so they can see you. And are you going to take that line down? <laughs> it looks like he has aged in the last yeah. uh, couple of weeks. Come on, Frank. Mr. President, the one thing I want to, you know, we have a, a poet in Mike Collins, and he really gave me a hard time for describing the words of fantastic and beautiful. And you were, I counted them, in three minutes up there, you used four fantastics and two beautifuls. <laughs> well, just let me close off with this one thing. I, I was thinking, as, as, as you know, as you came down, and we knew it was a success, and it had only been eight days, just, just a week, a long week, that this is the greatest week in the history of the world since the creation. Because as a result of what happened in this week, the world is bigger, infinitely. And also, as I'm going to find on this trip around the world, and as Secretary Rogers will find as he covers the other countries in Asia, as a result of what you've done, the world's never been closer together before. And we just thank you for that. And I only hope that all of us in government, all of us in America, uh, that as a result of what you've done, we can do our job a little better. We can reach for the stars just as you have reached so far from the stars. We don't want to hold you any longer. Anybody have a...